Everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Laura Masenka. I am the um, Deputy Director of Events here at Phil Abundance. Um, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping before we get started with our town hall today. Um, we are recording this for future sharing. Anyone who couldn't join us today will certainly share this afterwards. Um, we welcome your questions for our panelists today um, and feel free to use the chat box and we'll keep an eye on, um, on, on your questions. Anything that we don't have time to get to, um, we will certainly follow up with you after and um, all lines are muted in the meantime. I'm now going to turn this over to Sarah Hertz, our uh, Chief Development Officer, to get us started. Good afternoon, everyone. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. And if you've attended a town hall previously, as I know some of you have, thank you for making the time to join us again. Um, I'd like to especially thank many of you who have attended all or even nearly all of these virtual town halls. We created these as a means of trying to connect our key partners and supporters to our work during COVID. And it's really heartening to know that so many of you are interested in learning what we're doing every day and, and how we're operating. Um, if by any chance you're curious about who's watching this discussion with you, we are happy to welcome staff from various grant making foundations, individual donors, both those who are brand new to Phil Abundance and those who have supported our work for many years corporate partners and legislative partners who help support our work as well as other efforts to ensure people have access to food. Um, I'm really excited today to introduce an excellent panel of subject matter experts who are gonna discuss how their operations have been impacted by COVID, how they've responded and how the partnership with Phil Abundance works to help them get food to their communities. So um, today you're going to hear from Emily Glick, who works with me at Phil Abundance. She's our manager of agency relations, and she'll introduce herself to you and give you a sense of her background. But she has been tireless. In fact, all of these people who are speaking today have been tireless in their commitment to get food out to our communities. Our moderator today is Nikki Hawkins who is the Vice President of Community Engagement at 6ABC and is also a board member of Phil Abundance and we're really thrilled to have her today. Um, our other speakers, I'm really happy to introduce the Reverend Vito Baldino, who's the Director of Mercy and Justice for the Liberty Network and the Director of the Easter Outreach Program. Um, you'll hear directly from him and then um, hopefully we'll have Desiree Lamar Murphy, who uh, works for the Ujima Friends Peace Center Mitchell Elementary School and the Bywood Community Association. Um, we're hoping she'll be able to join us as well. And last but very much not least, uh, the Reverend Fisher Neal, who is the Executive Director of Feast of Justice, one of our key partners. And so now with that introduction, I'd really love to hand things over to my colleague, Emily Glick, who's going to provide some background on our efforts and how we work with our agency network. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of today's conversation. And before we get to the goodies of our agency representatives, um, I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, again, I'm Emily Glick, and I'm a manager in our agency relations department. I've been here for almost six years. I started here as an AmeriCorps VISTA um, and was, after my year of service, hired as a agency relations uh, department coordinator where I managed our Fresh For All sites, um, which is a former program of Phil Abundance, and then I helped transition the sites to be led by our agency network. Um, and then currently onboarding new agencies to Phil Abundance here. Um, I know some of you have been with us before, but I'm still just gonna give a quick overview of how we operate so that everybody is on the same page. Um, so we work with 350 agencies in our nine county service area. Again, is five in Southeastern Pennsylvania and four in Southern New Jersey. We work with a multitude of agencies uh, and organizations such as food pantries, emergency kitchens, neighborhood distributions, shelters, and group homes. Um, and I'm really excited to be joining today's conversation with some of the leaders of three of those amazing organizations. Um, as level setting again, our role at Agency Relations and across the board at Phil Abundance is to make sure that our partners in the community have exactly what they need to be serving their neighbors. They know their clients, they know their community. It's our job to focus on their needs so that they have everything to serve their clients and their neighbors. Um, their strength is connecting to the community directly to make sure that they're listening to their needs. 
Um, again, if you've been on these calls before, you've heard that our agencies have seen an increase of need by 30 to 60%. 30 to 60%. This is still true. Agencies are still seeing an increase of clients coming to their distributions every week. Just last week, over 35% of our reporting agencies said that they still need more food. This is not ending, unfortunately, and hunger is always an issue in Philadelphia and across our service area. Um, and to help th make things a little bit more tangible, I'm gonna kind of talk about numbers and pounds because that's how we communicate here at Phil Abundance. Uh, back in October, our targeted distribution pounds for the entire year, so October 1st through September 30th, was supposed to be 30.2 million pounds. So far this year, we've distributed 29 million pounds, uh, 14 of which have been since March 15th. 14 million pounds, half of our operating pound budget for the year in the last three months. It's really incredible, and that's why we're excited to have uh, you listen to some of our agencies who are helping to make that increase poundage happen. Um, so pre-COVID, this was one, point quarter, uh, one and a quarter million pounds going out every month. Since COVID started, since the middle of March, we're now doing two and a quarter million pounds. That's an 80% increase of pounds distributed throughout um, every month. And we're not even close to meeting the need. Um, as you heard a little bit, as I mentioned a minute ago, the demand is still so great. We feel very confident that with our current network, um, if we had the food and the equipment, we could move as four times as much food. Um, with our current network and all of their efforts. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the ways that we've been distributing food and different ways we've been getting it in. Uh, one of those is the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Um, this is a USDA program that uh, provides payments directly to farmers, um, but across the country, hunger relief, hunger relief organizations such as Phil Abundance are partnering with local and regional distributors to get foods directly into the hands of clients. The initial program um, is from May 15th through June 30th, and over the course of that month and a half, we're distributing an additional 3 million pounds of food into the community. That's on top of the 29 million we've already done. So we're now looking at 32 million pounds of food distributed through June 30th. Our staff is currently working on the next program period, which will run, for, run from July 1st through August 30th. We have agencies participating in all five of our Pennsylvania counties and two of our South uh, Jersey counties. And part of the CFAT program as well is our Phil Abundance drive through which some of you might know about. It is designed as a truck to trunk program um, so that people that are um, immunocompromised um, and have access to a car, they're elderly, they're just nervous about going to a distribution, they can come down to the drive through and get food directly into the back of their cars. Each vehicle receives one food share. Um, we're getting produce boxes from Seashore, um, which is part of the CFAT program, as well as Balfour gallons of milk. And the bread products that we're donating down there, um, or distributing out there, are donated by Bimbo Bread. Uh, the distributions have been occurring on Fridays from 9 to 1 at 7th and Patterson, um, and the space was generously donated by our partners at the Phillies. Um, in the past few weeks, we've distributed to about 700 cars every distribution. In addition to all of that, we've also been dabbling in meals a little bit. Of course, we have the Phil Abundance Community Kitchen, PCK, which I'm sure a lot of you know about because it's a really fantastic program. If you don't, look it up. Um, but they've more than doubled their production for their meals uh, since March. Uh, we've also started bringing in more meals, one of which was Operation Barbecue, an initiative put together by Feeding Pennsylvania and the state of Pennsylvania, um, working with restaurants across the state uh, to prepare half pan meals to uh, family style. Uh, and those are prepared, frozen, and they're brunch, or breakfast, lunch, and or dinner. In addition to that, there are MREs, uh, which are meals ready to eat. And these are meals that were donated by FEMA. They're really great for individuals uh, without kitchens or cookware. Um, and they come with a set of instructions on how to make sure that they're properly um, cooked um, with all of the little um, contractions in the little packet that you get and we were able to um, put those in seven different languages so that people across uh, languages could participate and receive and eat those meals. Additionally, we worked with Project Isaiah, which is a film, philanthropic organization based out of New York City. Uh, they were working with Gate Gourmet, an airline catering company that partnered to, and they partnered together to donate meals during the COVID crisis and that was across the country. Um, but we're really lucky to participate in that in Philadelphia here. 
then, you know, this is all really lofty. This is heavy. You're hearing the needs, you're hearing pounds distributed. Um, there's a lot going on and there's a lot more that we want to be doing. Um, but uh, it's kind of good to hear a couple of wins. So I'm going to end on that note. Uh, before COVID, uh, we were distributing our frozen and dry products to agencies every other week. Um, that was just an efficiency thing that we were doing um, with our partners. Um, but because of the great need, um, we have started doing those weekly. Agencies were not able to order two weeks worth of product and we heard them, we were listening to them. So we've made those deliveries happen weekly. Um, additionally, we've made more food available on our online ordering platform, Agency Express. So this paired with the increase in deliveries allows agencies to quickly and more efficiently move food out to the community. Now I'll turn things over to our moderator, Nikki Hawkins, to lead the discussion with some of the Abundance's amazing agency, rep agency representatives. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Emily, and thank you so much for all that uh, great information. Uh, it's, uh, we're so appreciative of what you and your team do every day to support our member agencies. And so I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, um, I do want to say thank you to our wonderful uh, development director, Sarah Hertz, for inviting me, as well as our dynamic CEO, new CEO, Lori Jones, who just took the helm uh, a mere three weeks ago. Uh, so Godspeed to her. So uh, again, uh, my name is Nikki Hawkins. I am a proud Phil Abundance board member. Um, and, and my other job at Channel 6, it has been difficult to see that in our newscasts almost every day, we are seeing news stories um, about the increased need um, uh, happening during COVID-19, um, high unemployment rates. So uh, this is a, a cause very near and dear to my heart. So I do want to take a moment to tell everyone thank you. Thank you so much for your support of Phil Abundance. Um, uh, thank you for just uh, your continued support as we're going through these difficult times. Thank you so much for joining us here. And this is the, uh, a really wonderful part. We're going to introduce you to three of our member agencies of the 350. And uh, as Emily said, they are really our hunger heroes, right? These are the people and the places and the programs and the community organizations that do, do the work, boots on the ground, right? Grassroots of delivering uh, the food to those in need, our neighbors in need. So without further ado, let's just start a conversation and see what they're seeing in their communities. Um, let's start with the Reverend uh, Vita Baldini of Liberty Churches. Vita, welcome. Please introduce yourself and tell us. Nikki, about. thank you so much. And guys, Phil Abundance, thank you so much for uh, letting me be a part of this conversation. Yeah, so I mean, I've been a pa I was a pastor uh, for the last nine years at a church in Center City, Philadelphia called Liberty Church, and we've partnered with uh, Phil Abundance in directly serving people experiencing homelessness in Center City, Philadelphia. And we also, I also was the director of an annual project called Easter Outreach, where we would work together with about 90 churches across the region to distribute a meal to families in need to connect to our neighbors uh, for the Easter season. So that was a one-time event that we would do every year in partnership with Phil Abundance. But when COVID-19 hit, we shifted from the one-time event to doing six days a week meal distribution across our network. We had a network of people, we were flexible. Phil Abundance was willing to work with us to get tremendous amounts amount of food out. So we currently operate six days a week um, doing different types of meal deliveries and all kinds of other ways. So that's kind of like where how we've been involved and we're just thankful to be a part of this conversation to be able to serve our community with such a great partner like Phil Abundance who's continued to be able to supply us with food to serve our neighbors uh, in need across Philadelphia. Reverend, thank you so much. Thanks again for, for the, all the work that you do. Um, next up, we'd like to welcome Desiree Lamar Murphy. Of the, she is the pantry site coordinator for the Ujima Friends Peace Center, Mitchell Elementary School, and Bywood Community Association. Welcome, Desiree. Hi, everyone. It's good to see everyone. Good to be a part of this panel. Um, I started out as resurrection site pantry coordinator uh, 12 years ago. I come from a lineage of women who have um, taken on a responsibility of helping to serve the community through Phil Abundance and through food organizations. Um, most recently, and one to touch my heart the most, was my coordination with um, Mitchell Elementary School and, to, and doing our um, super site and also 
I recently started uh, working with uh, the Bible Community Association and Prayer Chapel Church in Upper Darby. This is the one that's closest to my heart at the current time because what I'm hearing from my community people is that a large population of immigrants live in my neighborhood and they're not welcome at the local pantry because they have to have photo ID, they have to have proof of residency and other things that they just wouldn't have. So we started giving out at, at Prayer Chapel Church twice a month We'd like to do much more, but that's all we have uh, product to do right now. Um, but when they come, they say, you know, thank you for having us. No one else will have us. We can't go anywhere else. They're day laborers or they're, you know, they're construction workers or housekeepers or nannies, and none of them were able to work during COVID. So we, we were able to build relationships and bonds and even offer these people unemployment just through coming to um, the pantries. And they say they like coming to us because we have such a welcoming spirit. But we can't do any of that without Phil Abundance and their support. And I relied on Phil Abundance for the past 13 years because prior to that, I had this incident where I was homeless and my children were and my husband, you know, needed food and a local church bought us food. It wasn't what I would think is quality food, but we were grateful for anything. So my passion is to make sure that everyone that receives food receives quality variety food, even if it means we have to pay for it. And recently we've had to drive to Lancaster, to different farms, um, to Jersey, and we've been spending a lot of money at the three or four different sites that, I, that I'm working with and we're sharing, but we just don't have the product right now. But we want to be able to continue to provide quality meals, quality food with fruits, vegetables, starches, everything, because our people, many people don't eat canned goods. So we're trying to get a variety of things to everybody so that everybody has what they need to the best of our ability. So thank you for having me today and I'm waiting to hear what else is coming up next for us. Desiree, that's awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing uh, in the community and sharing your personal story as well. So, and um, last but not least, we're really excited to welcome Pastor Tricia from Feast of Justice. Hello, Pastor. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's really great to be here and to be able to talk a little bit about what Feast of Justice is doing and to hear what some of our other partners are doing around the community. That's a really important part of just uh, continuing in this work is being fed by what others are, are doing. Um, my name is Pastor Tricia Neal and I am the Executive Director of Feast of Justice, uh, which is located in the Mayfair area, but it's uh, serves the entire Northeast of Philadelphia, um, really with a mission of empowering transformation of individuals and families and communities and doing that through anti-hunger and education and life skills programs. Um, the primary way that we are really connecting with the community prior to COVID has been through meeting basic needs around food insecurity. So while we are working on trying to break the grip of poverty um, through providing education, through providing life skills and counseling programs, um, really people come to find us because of that basic need of food. And so we have been around that. We have been connected with Phil Abundance since we started back in 2007. Um, Phil Abundance has been providing us with, with bulk product to be able to meet some of that need. Um, and perhaps more importantly, prior to COVID, um, one of the biggest things that Phil Abundance had done for us was connecting us to grocer partners that would support food rescue operations. So those types of operations would give us uh, give us product, but it would also allow our grocer partners to have a, a place where they could be um, uh, making sure that food was getting to the people that needed it. Uh, so it was a really great partnership in being able to uh, have Phil Abundance help to foster that by connecting us with some, some people in the local community um, who had food to give, and then we could be the ones who would give it to the individuals around us. So it's been a long-term partnership pre-COVID. During COVID, it's a little bit different. And we have been, uh, we've really suspended all of our other programs that are the education and life skills programs right now because the big need in the community is uh, food insecurity. And it has exploded during this time. Um, we have seen uh, um, an increased need, just as Desiree was talking about, we are also one of the super sites um, that allows the city programs to be, um, the city food to be distributed to our guests twice a week. But in the very beginning, Feast of Justice had to sit and, and think about what our partners needed, what our community needed, uh, and decided that that program wasn't going to be enough for our community. And so we decided to actually expand our Feast of Justice program so we can provide 
um, dairy and meat and produce and dry goods and grab and go sandwiches and diapers and formula and all the types of things that families would need. So it has been a huge reach for us to be able to do this. Um, and the, the need is, out, is unbelievable in our community, uh, but thankfully through partnerships, um, Vito is one of our great partners in helping us to do some of the, the home deliveries. Um, through partnerships, we we're able to get this done. And so through working together, that's what makes this all possible. So I'm grateful for Phil Abundance and the work that Phil Abundance does to make this possible for the benefit of our community. It's wonderful. And I just want to say, Pastor Trish, that's awesome that you're pivoting to meet the need. And just thank you for all that you do. I, thank you to these three hunger heroes. I wish that everyone on the call that you could hear the claps, um, just the virtual high fives, right? Virtual hugs and just um, all the love and support that, that we give to you for doing what you do uh, before COVID and now during this increased time of need. So let's kind of get into a little bit more of uh, what you're continuing to see out there in the community. And I think Pastor Tricia, the first question was, what does COVID, the COVID crisis look like in your community and how have you adapted? I think you answered that question well. Are there any other um, uh, you said, there, is there anything else you want to add as far as how you've adapted? Um, but I think you pretty much answered the question well. Just a little bit. I could, I could say a little bit more. Um, uh, clearly, we've had to move everything outside. So that has been uh, interesting for us. We used to operate with everyone coming inside our building, and now it's a, a walk-up option. Or for the families that are most uh, immuno, immunocompromised, um, and for our seniors, it includes home delivery as well, which is a new part of the program that we had never included. Um, so we've, we've expanded quite a bit in being able to offer the things that we've talked about, but it's also a little bit of a loss in that families no longer have the choice. Since it's a walk-up model and since it's a home delivery model, um, there really isn't much of a choice from their end as to what it is that they're receiving. So um, there, is some, there are definitely some challenges with doing this, although we've had to do this to be able to be safe and to keep everyone safe during this time. And at, at this point, you know, pre-COVID, we were serving 285 families a week. Right now we're serving 1,700. So it's, uh, we've had no opportunity, no, no option, but to just go with this model that we're using currently. So. That's absolutely understandable. Thanks for, for definitely clarifying. And I'll follow up um, with how, um, uh, we'll start with uh, Reverend Vito. How has your organization adapted um, as we're still in COVID? So we had to think about what was the, the biggest need of the community um, and who was the most vulnerable. So one of the first efforts that we undertook was developing a home delivery system through church partnership, where we've been able to source uh, about 2,500 volunteers uh, to deliver meals across different sites. And like Trish says, we work with Feast of Justice to mobilize volunteers for home deliveries, particularly focusing on senior citizens, because this contactless delivery um, and a way to keep everyone safe, um, especially the most vulnerable, was a big thing. So like I said, we would do this one time a year, we would deliver food. So now we started working across, like even delivering the fill abundance uh, monthly senior boxes through some of your agencies and helping other churches develop a delivery system because you should see the way someone responds. Like some of the senior boxes I've delivered personally, you see the person as you leave the box at the doorstep and you get to see the person have this big smile when they realize that this is my food for the month and I don't have to go out and risk my safety or ride a bus. Uh, it just is like you could see in their in their like in their facial expression just the relief, and I mean to see to have someone that has to be hungry and they have to put their personal safety or eating like that's the reality for some people. They have to think I have to risk and be vulnerable to go outside to eat, um, but I need to eat. So it's like they weigh that. So the fact that we can offer delivery to people that are more vulnerable that have medical or or uh, seniors really I think is one of the things that we really tried to spearhead in the beginning and go all in on immobilizing delivery drivers across the Philadelphia region. The smiles, I think that's, you know, to smiles of, of the deliveries, that's, that's quite, that's quite amazing. And, and Desiree, how have you, how has uh, your team adapted during, during this time of a, a global pandemic? Well, um, like both pastors said, it took a lot of restructuring, thinking out, thinking about what, how we can best serve the community. So two of the agencies continue to just give out boxes or pre-made um, 
packages, which do eliminate a lot of the, a lot of the um, consumers' options. However, the other two have worked very safe, uh, diligently on how to be safe and continue um, serving supermarket style. So every, every we have like long six foot tables, something at one end, something at the other end, so they can come up, grab, we have the stuff pre-bagged for them, but they still can take options from off the table. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that everyone has masks, even if they don't have them, we provide them for them because they're gonna need masks no matter where they go, not just when they come to see us. But just like Pastor Vito said, we had a fan, we had partner with some social workers at the local schools to get names of families that were COVID impacted and well i'm sorry not the names the telephone numbers and addresses so that we can deliver to them because they can't go out um we had one family unfortunately whose child um passed from COVID, and we were giving the weekly de delivery to that mother and she would reach out of her bedroom window and she would blow kisses and to say thank you and then to find out a few weeks later um, when we went to make a delivery that her child had just passed so and she one thing she said was it really touched me that every week i knew that it was groceries coming and it was things for her kids, things for her, things for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She didn't have to go out because she couldn't go out. Um, so making the deliveries, taking time to talk to families and listen to them, um, find ways to support their mental health because this was a challenging time for mental health as well. Um, and also finding ways to keep everyone safe, all of our volunteers safe. Those were the biggest, the biggest efforts that we had during this time. And again, uh, our, fan, our hearts go out to the, that family that you, that you spoke about and uh, how wonderful it is that, that you and your agency were there at such a difficult time and there for so many. Um, and Desiree, I'm going to stick with you when it comes to, you know, the school closures. Um, your agency has been able to support families affected by the absence of, you know, a simple breakfast and lunch provided by the school district. So if you could, you know, continue to share about how you've been supporting families. Uh, around the absence of school lunches. So, uh, yes, yeah, so around the absence of school lunches, we have the families, um, we have the families come to the Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Thursday distribution as well. Um, we partner with the schools to make sure that they, all the schools that are giving out the lunches are giving out lunches. And if the families need a little extra than the lunch, they can come and get a box on the days that we get boxes. So we encourage them to come. Um, we did partner with counselors in Upper Darby School District, because that's where um, Bywood is, and Prairie Chapel, as well as Philadelphia School. I'm a Philadelphia school teacher. So I know what it's like for kids to come to school and snow and rain and everything, because they just want a meal, regardless of how they behave when they get there. So it's very important to me that we, you know, think, consider the children as well as the elderly, but especially the children because they don't have any resource to get their own food. And we would have the children and tell them, hey, go get your parents, tell your parents to come back because we can get you more food, you know, through our fill abundance boxes or on our Friday extra deliver, um, give sharing day where we go to Lancaster and get extra produce and extra things. So it was really good to partner with the schools because that's where we were able to really get to even to support even the youngest of individuals and children throughout the city and Upper Darby, Delaware County as well. Excellent. Beautiful to hear. Thank you for that work, for your work in that area. Um, and Pastor Tricia, how about you? How have you been supporting uh, students at this time? Um, at this time, we are really just making sure that families can come as often as they need to, to be able to get the resources. Because I think that um, I know in my own house, I'm kind of overwhelmed. I've got three children at home and just overwhelmed by how much food they eat when everybody's stuck at home all the time. And so I'm realizing that, you know, all of Philadelphia is going through that. All of Philadelphia is, is surprised by, uh, especially families with children, um, surprised by how great of a resource the schools had been to be providing that food. Uh, and now that resource is gone. And so um, whereby in the past we would have, uh, been forced to really limit how frequently families could come to receive the, the support, um, we realize that that's all off the table at this point, that, that families are just trying to get by and so they can come uh, as often as they need to, to be able to get the resources that they need. Um, and because of the fact that we can be both the city super site and, and the, the regular Feast of Justice programs, um, they can come on days when they can receive different types of things. So if they just need produce, they can come on one day or, or you know, it can, it can vary a little bit. So giving families those options as to uh, the, both the quantity and the, the types of foods that they would receive and hopefully helping them out. Through the families, excellent, very good. And uh, Reverend Vito, how about you? 
Yeah, so I said we focused a lot of our attention on senior citizens, but obviously our churches are in neighborhoods and in communities where there's families and children. So one of the churches, particularly in South Philadelphia, partnered early on with the schools down there around 2nd and Moore Street, and they've been doing about 250 weekly deliveries to the families. So that's been going on since about the second week of March. So they've been doing that. And we have other sites that, I mean, we serve families as well. I mean, especially our West Kensington site, Pastor Reverend Adon has been unbelievable being open almost every day. He's one of the city super sites as well. And we get him food all week long. He pretty much allows people to come whenever they want. And Desiree, you brought up a very interesting point about uh, some of the, some of the, um, when you, when you think about uh, immigrants and you think about them being nervous, because the city site staff police officers, which is for good reason, but that definitely scared a lot of our immigrant families away. So Reverend Adon has been working with New Sanctuary Movement and some other people to schedule times that aren't the times that the city site is operating to have people come and pick food up. So just having food access more available and being flexible to the type of community you're serving and really having on the ground partners that we can support just by sourcing them with food food so they can serve the community uh, and be able to get the food out to the people that need it most without them having to worry about some of these other stumbling blocks, I think has really been uh, a real benefit. And that also is serving families and kids um, because they feel nervous to go to some of the more official sites. Absolutely, definitely understandable. Um, uh, you know, hunger knows no boundaries, right? It's, it's everybody uh, is, in, is in need at this time. Um, one of the questions, you know, uh, this, this veto to you was uh, talking about seniors and um, immunocompromised individuals. Um, and I think you, you spoke a lot about the delivery service all of you have. Um, and Desiree spoke about how your social distancing. Uh, does anyone have any more comments? And I can start with Vito just about how during this, just reimagining how your social distancing, mask wearing, maybe even talk about some of the some of the things that you're also in need of as we're, we're talking about food, but what are some of the other um, resources that you think that you need or that you're lacking in regards to staying, to making sure that you stay socially distanced while giving the food or delivery, if, and we'll start with Vito in that regard. Yeah, we spent about, I mean, obviously, COVID crisis response, about two weeks, but seemed like a tremendous amount of time writing up safety protocols and mm -hmm. delivery systems of like, how to remain socially distanced. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the things was that I realized is working primarily with volunteers, we had to show volunteers that we were like organized and were serious. And once we did that, we even created like a little volunteer video that we sent out the thing that talked about hand washing, social distancing, mask wearing, all those different things is people felt a lot more comfortable to come out because early on in COVID, there was like a dual message. It was like, stay home. And we're saying, come out and deliver to help people that can't come out. So it was like this interesting phase where we had to really be really uh, good on our communication of our social distancing stuff. So yeah, early on getting gloves and sanitizer and masks was very challenging. Um, I think some of that stuff has opened back up. We can obviously always use the uh, PPE supplies. Uh, to be able to them, I think being able to have a process in place and people see that it's organized, I mean, really allowed us to mobilize a lot of volunteers. And it's also important for people's safety. So yeah, I mean, we spent a lot of time on that. Tra training is the key, um, as we've gotten so many mixed messages about what to do, what not to do, uh, if you know, people are believing it. And you know, this is real. Uh, you're, you're serving a vital need, but you also have a vital need to support uh, your staff as well as your volunteers. So Desiree, on that note as well, um, what are some of the, the needs, increased needs and um, for as you are dealing in this pandemic? I would say, um, just like Pastor Vito said, making sure that we have the necessary PPE material, the masks, mm -hmm. not just for the volunteers, but for the people that come because we don't want to turn anybody away because they don't have a mask. Mm -hmm. I know there have been some um, supplies randomly available and it was very good to get to see that were masks on the Phil Abundance uh, Agency Express and we all like were grabbing and we were calling other agencies like say hey they got masks available keep you safe and they're free they're not like a thousand dollars a box so that was good to make sure that you know we had the the at least some of the um, supplies that we we needed because we couldn't purchase it anywhere 
also um, making sure that we voice to the seniors, like we know you're hearing scary things on the news, but this is the real deal. Like you can come out, we are gonna keep you safe. We have set up a structure in the schoolyard where there's a hopscotch, uh, where the kids play hopscotch and it's about 10 feet apart. So we have the people come in, we show them, step on this square, step on this square, that way they're safe. And then we just hand the box over and they can go out the other end of the schoolyard. So just coming up with pro um, procedures and protocols was very, um, integral in making sure that people, volunteers fit, felt safe, especially since most of the volunteers that we have are seniors because they're the ones without COVID, without this home, working from home stuff, they're the ones that are working every day they, at our food pantries. Those the seniors, um, disabled people, people that are unemployed are our volunteers. And we want to make sure that after COVID, they're still safe and sound and continue to, can continue to volunteer with us. I have to tell you, blessing to all the volunteers, right? Can we give a, a clap, a, a shout, uh, just a, an appreciation, a thumbs up to, to all the myriad of volunteers that uh, work with your organizations and all of our member organizations. And so Pastor Tricia, any more needs that you have uh, to help serve you know, um, compromised individuals in, in this time? Absolutely, I think that um, definitely as, as far as what Pastor Vito and what Desiree were saying, um, the, the fact that having PPE available right now has been, um, has been unbelievably helpful. Um, and then also uh, the same thing, having to take a few weeks in the beginning to come up with safety protocols, um, both for how we operate as volunteers, but then also how we convey that information to our guests that are waiting outside. Um, one of the things that we are facing right now is that um, uh, the, the size of the lines is huge, uh, as, and also the uncertainty in terms of families really wanting to get here early so that they can be sure that they're going to be able to access the food. And that was all fine in March and April, but now that we're getting into July, as families are coming and having to wait outside for hours um, to be able to just make sure that they're gonna be able to access the food is first of all, heartbreaking, um, but second of all, unhealthy uh, given the, the the, the heat that's outside. Um, so we actually are seeing some challenges with maintaining social distancing for our guests. They are, they're showing up, but then after it gets hot, after five minutes, um, they want to get underneath of a tree or they want to find shade in some ways. And so you see more people congregating into, into tight areas just so that they can be um, remotely comfortable uh, during this time. So we are, we've started a process um, and hopefully in July, our plan is that we're going to be uh, shifting our, our, our um, distribution method. So we are going to be opening up our building again and allowing families to be able to come in and also to be making appointments for when they can come in so that they won't have to be so nervous about whether or not they are going to be able to, to access the food and therefore feel like they have to be waiting in line for so long. So, um, so uh, really trying to just, uh, um, I guess we're grateful for the support. You know, Phil Abundance is making that happen. They were able to get us a refrigerator, an additional refrigerator. Um, we've got some additional shelving they've been able to help us acquire for this um, because the entire model inside the building is completely different than what it was pre-COVID because we've had to spread out and, uh, and, and take up twice as much space. So um, thinking through the ways that even just the summer heat is affecting our guests has been a challenge of late. And what a way to adapt. And, and uh, that's a, a good point bringing up with the heat, right? As we're already at what, 80, what is it, 86 today already? And, you know, uh, hardly a cloud in the sky. Um, I do want to um, uh, speak. We have uh, two more questions. Um, so civil unrest, right? The uh, George Floyd protests the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, there, uh, through a, the last few weeks, there's been a lot going on within the city limits of, of Philadelphia and within the surrounding suburbs um, on uh, criminal uh, injustice, racial equity. So how have, um, it, it forced some essential businesses to close, right, for a little while. Has this affected your community in, in any way, shape or form, um, Desiree? If you want to if you speak to that? Yes, I'll gladly speak to this. Um, one side is in Upper Darby, which is right near 69th Street, which 69th Street was one of the hardest hit areas. So not only were um, the supermarkets and the stores closed, but we had um, the armored cars, which scared a lot of people, uh, you know, patrolling the area. So people wouldn't come out. And then, of course, the other 
Two of the other sites are in Southwest Philadelphia. Um, some, some families go to the Parkside supermarket, which was um, destroyed. Thank God Mr. Brown decided to open back up because they waited 14 years because that's a food desert. Um, four two and four three where we are. Um, those, that, those are food deserts, but those were the areas of the city of Philadelphia that were hurt the hardest um, as far as shopping, um, even, even us distributing. The first day of distribution was that Monday after everything happened and everyone was terrified to like even volunteer. So, you know, our people were looking for us. They still were coming out to get food. They were waiting in line, but you know, we had to tell them that we had to shut down because of, you know, the civil unrest and most of them understood. Uh, but they were glad to see us back open on Thursday. Um, so we were, we missed our police officers um, our, and our sheriffs who help and support us. They're back now. Um, we missed them. We welcomed them back. We know they had a hard job, but you know, it was very, very challenging for people in Southwest Philadelphia because it's challenging without COVID and without civil unrest, but it was extra challenging. So we found ourselves supporting more, buying more food and giving out more stuff because during the times when the markets were closed, they had no other option. We appreciate you stepping up to meet that need and, and understanding. And you brought up a, just a really big point about uh, food deserts and how um, that is uh, even harder on our member agencies in, in certain areas um, in that regard. So again, thank you for stepping up during that time to meet that need. Uh, Pastor Tricia, uh, Reverend Vito, any issues with um, those, la those few couple weeks? Pastor Tricia. It was limited for us. We had some, uh, there was, there were some businesses in the local area that were closed. Um, I would say that the bigger challenge that we had was not necessarily um, that our guests could not access the grocery stores. It was that there was just an, an air of anxiety that was much higher during that time. Um, so it, it uh, we're grateful that we were able to stay open through it because if there were stores that were affected, um, locally that families could at least access the resources through us. Um, but, uh, but there were definitely, you know, as Desiree said, without having the, the local police and without the local sheriffs with us, um, it, it was all on us in case there were any challenges, in case there were any problems. Um, and so it, uh, it, it, um, it caused some anxiety from, our, from amongst our volunteers, amongst our staff, and also from our guests standing in the line. And so I think we, we just saw some differences in, in um, engagement that week. And, um, interesting. Yeah. interesting, interesting, I hear you. And, and um, Reverend Vito, did you um, experience any, any downtick, uptick? <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously it was a very trying time for people. Uh, Desiree, like I'm from West Philadelphia, so the Parkside area, Mr. Brown and that supermarket uh, was like dear to my heart as in like really coming into the community and just some of the things. And I just have to tell you a, a good thing, like Phil Abundance gave us 1600 produce boxes and 2000 gallons of milk that we gave out in West Philly the week that happened when the supermarket was closed. So we saw about seven or eight churches come together at 47th and Lancaster in the heart of West Philadelphia at Christian Stronghold Church and we came together. Everyone knew this was a trying time. Everyone knew this was challenging and we went out together and gave meals to our neighbors. It was, and the, and the, and the, uh, they had a men's prayer service at the church that day. So we all got to take some time to mourn and weep and pray together about what was going on in the country. It was actually probably one of the most powerful things I've experienced during this COVID-19 crisis. And because Phil Abundance was so generous in their donation to give us that much food for that Saturday, we were really able to serve the West Philly neighborhood. That's excellent and a great story to share um, as our nation. Uh, uh, walks slowly towards healing, right, um, and understanding um, for, for us all. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we definitely need prayer at this time. Um, as we, we spoke about one of the last questions we have here is it's, it, the local economy is starting to open, right? We're opening up quick, right? <laughs> really quick all of our, within our counties. Um, but there are still so many unemployed still, right? Um, we have um, whether it comes to SNAP benefits, the pandemic unemployment assistance, other benefits created under the CARES Act, you know, so the city imposed utility shutoffs, eviction freezes, they're scheduled to end over the next two months. So, so what happens next? Let's, let's get a little bit of your feedback and, and we'll start with Pastor Tricia. This is coming and this is coming quickly. 
come in quickly, um, unfortunately. So I think uh, depending on how, uh, how you look at this, I think some people think that this is coming to an end, as you said. I mean, some people think that, that uh, people are going back to work and, and you'll see a lot of positive changes. And that is true in many ways, but I think that the community that we're serving is not going to be affected by this. I think we're looking at this for a, a very long period of time of this, this huge um, uptick for us. Um, we know that a lot, of, a lot of the guests that are new to us are, are first generation immigrants as well. Um, we also understand that from talking to a lot of the guests that are in line, uh, that a lot are gig workers and that that kind of work is not going to come back immediately. It's, uh, or, or are working in small businesses that won't reopen. Um, they won't be the first ones rehired. Uh, so um, we know that the need, the increased need right now is going to continue and we are planning for it all the way through the end of next summer for, for a level at this size um, all the way through the end of next summer, which is going to become extra challenging uh, and definitely we'll be leaning upon Bill Abundance and our other partners as we get to the end of the summer because the city super site program is only going through the summer. And so once that ends, all of those families who have been receiving all of those, all of that food um, will need to be coming back to the food cupboards. Um, so we, we recognize that this is going to be an increased need. Absolutely. Um, uh, Desiree, uh, in, in a community that's, that's hard hit by unemployment pre-COVID during the pandemic, and of course, after the pandemic, if you can talk about what you're hearing and that type of anxiety that's... Uh... Sure. I'm hearing from different um, recipients that some of them are headed back to work. Um, some of them, many of them are not. Many of them have suffer, are suffering childcare issues because a lot of the childcare centers are still not closed or people don't feel comfortable sending their children to school so they still won't work. So it's like, to me, it's like, if you don't pay a bill or don't pay a couple of bills for a while, and that, that even a better analogy, you stay home, you gain all this weight during COVID. It's so hard to get it off. It's the same thing with, this, with the, the food shortage that we have right now. Just a week or two weeks or a month without work, that'll set you back for it a long time, not just a year, maybe even longer. So we're continuing to do this work even after um, the COVID. It's nice to have the extra support right now. We're hoping that the support continues. We know that it's hard to get product, but we gotta get product into the hands of these people because they're already behind the eight ball, many of them, most of them. Um, even though going, they're going back to work, they still are not working full-time hours. Stores are still not open you know, 6 a.m. to 10 at, 10 at night. Many of the, um, many of the young teenagers, the, the children, they don't have summer jobs and they won't have the opportunity to have a summer job. So the thousands of dollars they could have made over the summer, now they don't have. I have a house full of college students. They are unable to work. They work at the mall. They work at the movie theater. The movie theaters still aren't open. Many restaurants still aren't open. So this is gonna continue for a while. So I feel that we have to do all that we can to continue to support our communities well throughout. This is gonna take a long time to bounce back from. I don't think it's going to be an easy feat. Um, I think you said it. It's not going to be easy to bounce back, and this will be extended. I like how you said that this is kind of cumulative, right? It's you know just a couple weeks out of work, a month or two out of work. It really impacts uh, for for months, and and it lingers, if you will. And uh, 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 Reverend Vito, your thoughts on as some of these stimulus and supplements end mm -hmm. for our community. Yeah, I mean, it's multiple phases. I mean, you had the hit right away, people that got out of work, and then you had people that eat through money or credit cards, or now they got to pay rent and all these things, friends, all those resources eventually dry up with someone's network of how they can continue to survive day to day. Um, this is going to go on for a while. I mean, the statistics are saying one to three years, um, food insecurity is going to be a real problem. Um, we have really been working with just creating sustainable systems in our neighborhoods, knowing that this is going to have to be something that's ongoing. Uh, this is not getting better tomorrow. Like Desiree said, it's a compounding issue. Um, the communities that have had high levels of poverty are affected even more so in a situation like this, and it's sad. And every person should be able to have food to eat. Every person in all of Philadelphia, all of the counties should have food to eat. And I'm thankful for the commitment of Phil Abundance and for partners 
uh, for all the agencies that are out there doing that hard work. And I mean, that's our commitment. We just have a simple vision. We want to help people get food. I mean, it's like very simple. It's basic. And everyone should have a meal to eat each night. I mean, they should. They should. And I think that's a wonderful place to end. I think that's a wonderful um, sentiment that, you know, the mission is simple um, to feed communities in need. Um, everyone should have a meal. I can't tell you how uh, enlightening um, and, and hopefully uplifting, not only was this for me, but for all that are watching. What incredible work the three of you are doing in your communities, along with so many of the other partner agencies. So I just want to thank you for just um, what you were doing before we were hit the pandemic, before there was civil unrest. We just um, also just send you so much sustained good well wishes as you continue to do the work that you're, the important work that you're doing uh, in your communities. Uh, we uh, just appreciate that you uh, are working with Phil Abundance. We're so thrilled to have Phil Abundance in this region, right? Working with you for so many years. Um, but we just, we just say, I think um, as I get a little bit filled up, the mission is to make sure our neighbors in need are fed. So we thank you, Reverend Vito um, with Liberty Church. We thank you, Pastor Tricia Neal with um, Feast for Justice. We thank you, Desiree Lamar uh, um, Murray with um, uh, your organization. Let me get let me, it's here. What your organization, name of your organization again. Ujima Resurrection, Mitchell, and Bywood. <laughs> Bywood, I love it. That's too wonderful. I'm going to throw it back to Sarah Hertz, but I hope those listening, um, again, here is who you're supporting. This is who your donations are supporting. These are, this is um, who um, you're empowering to empower the community, uh, to be healthy, to be whole, to be fed. I'll send it back to Sarah, and thank you so much. Thank you. I don't even know what to say. Thank you to each of you who made the time to join us today and to hear from our trio of remarkable frontline partners. And I really want to thank Nikki for giving her time and her passion um, to this conversation today. As you heard, our work is far from finished. The energy around providing financial and other resources has diminished over this period, but as you heard, the demand for food and other basic human services continues to press on. Please feel free to share the link to this discussion with others who you think might have interest and or influence and wanna know about this work and learn more about it. We're all partners in creating a community in which people are fed, housed, and educated Thank you for joining us and may your plates always be full.